Story one. In 2016, my boyfriend, now my husband and I went camping in Eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop for the night was primitive. Camping was free, no cell service, barely a road, etc. We did encounter two other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all, but they were creepy. So I'll describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off to the side of the road a little as we drove past. She had the hood open and seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer to help. Usually, my boyfriend had no problem helping someone, but he said his time, something about her, put him off. She didn't really seem like she needed help, and usually, people who need help look at you, hopefully, as you approach. She looked like she just expected we would stop. That's what my boyfriend said anyway. I hadn't really noticed anything that strange about her. The next person came when we had chosen a spot and were setting up a fire for hot dogs. I had noticed people drive by a few times, but my boyfriend pointed out each time was the same car, and the man in the car watched us each time he passed. My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this, but we had driven around for a while before finding a place we liked. It had been raining and everything was muddy and we wanted the driest site possible. He could have been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving, but the road was muddy too. If he wanted to find us, all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks, but not many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us again. He didn't come by another time, so we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark goofing off. No one else drove by. Whether or not those two had anything else to do with our experience, the real fear came later. We had gone to sleep in our tent, and sometime around 3 a.m., we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well, or even remember exactly what it sounded like, but my boyfriend said it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. It was also similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker is another way he described it. He jumped up and looked out the little window, but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself another few times. I was too scared to speak, so my boyfriend whispered that it was probably miles off and I should go back to sleep. I didn't question this as I figured loud sounds could be easily heard miles off. After we left, he told me it sounded like it had actually been coming from just down the road, but he didn't want to freak me out. Looking back, I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper if apparently the sound was far off. I was still terrified. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We lay there for a while longer when finally my boyfriend told me to get dressed because we were leaving. I got alarmed by this and even more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete we had bought just for this trip from its plastic before opening the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own, but despite the moon providing plenty of light, I couldn't really see. I did point out something my boyfriend hadn't noticed though before we got into the car. There was a beer can by our dead fire that hadn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. While we were driving away, my boyfriend explained that he was nervous someone might have been trying to lure us out, so he didn't think it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find out the gas tank had been siphoned out, but that wouldn't have stopped us because we had a hybrid car. We joked that that would make a funny hybrid commercial. A number of brutal murders were avoided by driving a hybrid. Two. We only joked because we were about shitting ourselves from fear and adrenaline, even then. For the rest of our trip, we only stayed in well-populated campsites or got a hotel. Story 2 One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in the southeast U.S. Haven't spoken in years, as is the case with age. But I remember about eight, nine years back, he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park several days in a row and found out they were visiting from out west, and they had gotten engaged there decades prior. They had been searching for a spot they'd taken pics of where he popped the question, 
but we're having trouble. After looking at the pics and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to, he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought it would be. They found it, and he left them there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came time to lock up at night, he still hadn't seen them leave, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down, spooning along the bank of the river. Neither was alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards, and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later, he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both committed suicide by ingesting some sort of chemical pill combination medley. They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged. My bud wasn't torn up about it. He was obviously sad about them dying, but said that he thought they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think they helped kill them. Story 3 my cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana-Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants, so I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all our gear in saddlebags or saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area and wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, you wanna see something weird? Of course, I said yes. So she led me on a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from the actual path we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It is one of those you can plug in or wind up and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to. But that kills the batteries quickly. I do and out in the middle of fucking nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large like some buried transmission wire, but small like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees. So naturally, I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees, then back to the ground, then it snakes around rocks and finally dead ends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up with a metal base and a pseudo wood plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. I am staring confused as all hell at this desk in the middle of a forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord and plugs it into the outlet. That fucker then lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. Weird as shit. No spooky jump scares or bodies, just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. I wish I had taken a picture of it, Story four. Not a ranger, but was hiking in Andorra with a friend. Long story short, we got lost off the trail and ended up in Spain. Found another trail and were following it, without a map. A while ahead of us, we see a man with two golden retrievers walking in the same direction we are. He looks young and is carrying climbing gear over his shoulder. We're rushing down the trail to catch up with him and finally do. We ask him for help with directions, and he tells us exactly where we are and where we need to be. About 12 kilometers away, there's a town with a hotel. He says there's another smaller town about six kilometers away and that he parked his car there. 
He says he can give us a lift for the last six kilometers if we like, but says that he's in a hurry. We are over the moon, and so we hike together for a while. The dogs are nice and friendly, running circles around us. We are chatting away to the guy and he is really nice, but my friend and I are getting tired and so we cannot keep pace with him for long. The trail bends away to the right and the man, now a bit ahead of us, disappears behind the bend. We get there a couple of minutes later and the trail is empty. No man and no dogs, even though the trail is a straight run for quite a while and we should have been able to see them. The two of us continue, alarmed, waiting to hear, see something, or perhaps be murdered by a stranger. Nothing. We got to the town eventually, and from there made it to the safety of the hotel in the next town over. We were completely freaked out by his sudden disappearance, and to this day, we are both convinced he was a ghost. Story 5, X-Ranger here. We had a group of frat boys making way too much noise. We came by twice, and at the second stop, I told them, this is your last warning. Not only is it rude for other campers to be so loud, it's exceptionally dangerous. Everyone knows that the local mountain lions are attracted to loud noises at night. And these ghost cats, as they are called, can creep right up on you without you hearing or seeing them. Whatever you do, don't leave your tent tonight. If you hear anything, don't make a sound. We went back to the station and grabbed the lion pelt from the inner center and the night vision goggles. The head ranger had to blow what was left of the budget at the end of the previous year. Once they were all in their tents, we crept into the campsite and made fake lion tracks everywhere. We set up the lion pelt propped up over some sticks. The other ranger got out of the PA and from a distance started doing fake lion calls, slowly getting closer. I pulled the Jeep forward like we were arriving on scene and got out, turned on my mag light and illuminated the silhouette of the lion pelt. Because I was moving quickly, the shadow of the lion appeared to be moving. At this point, the frat boys were losing it. Jim, the other ranger, shouted, stay in your tents, followed shortly by, she's coming around at us. And then there's another one. And finally, let's get the fuck out of here. At that point, we turned off the flashlights, grabbed the lion pelt in the darkness, jumped in the Jeep, and sped off. Just after sunrise, they started peeking out of the tents. Nobody was brave enough to get out until about 8.30. When they saw all the huge paw and claw prints everywhere, they really freaked out. Story 6. I've had two camping encounters with bears. One bear each time. This was a very long time ago, and I don't even remember which state it was because I was traveling. My partner and I had set up camp, and the tent was only a few feet from the permanent grill the park had set up. We cooked something to eat, cleaned up, then went to bed. Sometime during the night, we heard grunting and shuffling about, then started hearing a slurping sound. I knew it was a damned bear, but I was so scared I was frozen. For some reason, the gun was on my side, and my partner told me to hand him the gun, but I couldn't. I was paralyzed with fear. He finally reached over and grabbed it. We sat there listening for what felt like forever. The slurping had stopped, but we didn't dare leave the tent. A few minutes later, we hear several loud booms, metal on metal. What the hell? The next morning, we went down to the parking lot, and there was a metal dumpster with bear prints all over it. The next bear sighting was in Montana, had been camping pretty far in, and the next morning the guys got up early and went fishing. I was in camp by myself. I got dressed, opened the tent, and when I stood up I saw the biggest cinnamon-colored bear I had ever seen. It didn't see me at first, and I was scared, didn't know what to do. The truck was about a yard away, but not between me and the bear. I thought I wanted to get to the truck and grab my camera. Yeah, don't fear for my life or anything, just get some photos. I started backing up, never taking my eyes off the bear, and it heard me. The bear stood up on its hind legs, and I swear it must have been 10 feet tall. It was directly behind the tent. It looked at me, I looked at it, and I took off running to the truck. The bear got scared and sauntered off. Whoo. 
I'm glad it wasn't a grizzly or I wouldn't be here right now. Story seven. I was the lone recreation ranger in a small district in Southern Idaho. The nearest town from the guard station was about 1.5 hours away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors. Bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. The woods there always had an eerie feeling to them, unlike the Southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night, I was returning from my grocery run, always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes, about 3.5 to 4 FT in the air. To say I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling, get the fuck out of here, but the eyes only crouched down and inched closer. At this point, I could tell it was a large animal of some kind, definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area and the creature leaped back a bit, but did not make a sound. Tossed four or five more pieces and the creature still inched forward. At this point, I fumbled with the keys, of course. The fucking solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grabbed my shotgun. Technically, you are not supposed to have guns in gov housing, but who the fuck lives in the hills have eyes backcountry and does not carry? Went outside and the creature was a bit closer. Still could not get a good look with my shitty headlamp. Loaded shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, the trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, rocking bench and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch, but never found any tracks after that point. Considering that it was always muddy up there, it was weird to not find any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. Story eight. I was in the Gila wilderness and a convoy of us campers fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mogollon to Snow Lake when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out some idiot tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rock makes it hard to stop. They went over the edge and high centered we're miles from the nearest official campground, and it's early spring, and the nighttime gets pretty damn cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, a fanny pack, and the purple velvet sweatsuit. That's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and he tells us he's German and having a great time. We could not get over the purple velvet suit. It was like a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious, wants to know where's he staying and where he came from. It was around nine in the morning and the only way he could have gotten where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guy is a goofy fuck and just points off toward the other mountain when he asked where he's staying, Durar, going. We all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense above 5,000 feet, even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road and goes off into the woods. The ranger told us he can't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening, the ranger popped by to tell us that nobody at any other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers, and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in a purple pimp sweatsuit. That range rolled off duty the next day, 
and his replacement came by to make sure the other ranger was smoking something we gave him. We assured him it all happened. Never heard another word about the German in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but makes for a good story. Story 9 I have been a ranger in the USFS for almost 15 years, but this takes place about three years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites. Weird since wolves aren't known to be in the area. But when you work in the field long enough, you start to realize anything is possible. No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal, thank God. I departed from the station around noon to check out the places where it had been sighted. Wandered around for about three hours, no further calls during that time until I took a break for water, sat down, had a snack, drank some water, and was getting ready to go again when the thing was about 20 feet out, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had the collar, so I whistled to it and he came over to me. Getting a closer look, I could see it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it'd be confusing from a distance. I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me. But as soon as I said I'd bring it in, the dog fucking took off. Like he was playing to see how far he could get me to chase him. Typical dog behavior. I went after it, and I swear it was a game of chase for at least five minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Please don't go running through woods unless you know the area like the back of your hand. The dog finally slowed down near a rock bed creek area and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first, but then I noticed it. The overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones. I called it in immediately, and another team was sent to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male who died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He'd been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger, and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone. She called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought I'd said something wrong since there was a pause on her side of the line. After I gave a couple of details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunken into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that had led me to him. I think I spent the rest of the day stunned. I continue to be in disbelief in a way, but I know what happened. Thanks for watching. Don't leave before leaving a like to this video. Also hit the subscribe button to support my work. And as always, have a horrific nightmare my dear.